<laughs> All right, guys. Pathfinder 1.4 is here tonight. We've got it for you. There's huge changes, especially for you half-orcs and half-elves out there. We have to talk about it right now. Like and subscribe, but we're not worried about that. We gotta talk about this. It's huge. Also, this episode was brought to you by the man who made me aware that 1.4 had came out on October the 8th at 9-ish p.m. 360 Mac Gamer. Also, thanks for dealing with me and learning the fantasy grounds with me. You're a good dude. Now, let's dive in with our brand new rules for heritage feats. As of update 1.4, the Paizo guys are adding more benefits to ancestries at first level via automatic heritage options. In addition to that first level ancestry feat, now we pick a heritage feat. These are taking the place of the heritage feats of the printed Pathfinder playtest rulebook, which I think is amazing. Literally, I was making a video tonight on the dwarves of the playtest and why Hardy was a bad heritage feat because you could only take it at first and how it was unfair and nope, not anymore. Heritage feats are getting overhauled. New feats are being added to replace those that are getting the ax. Here we go. We're gonna start at the back of the update this time. We're starting with human heritages. Now it's no longer your one and only ancestry feat at first level to be a half elf or half work. Now, that's a heritage. Choosing half elf gives you the elf trait and low light vision, and in addition, you can pick elf, half elf, and human feats whenever you gain an ancestry feat. One assumes that means right out the gate. Of course, it's the same with orcs, and that's huge. For a little while, I did play a half elf ranger, and it was kind of disappointing to me that I was going to have to wait to take ride as a class feat at level three and just have to suffer being a mounted character with less action economy than the rest of the squad between here and there. That was rough, but I wanted to be a half-elf for flavor and backstory reasons. Now we can have both super good skilled heritage. It allows you to become trained in one skill of your choice. At fifth level, you're an expert at it. And versatile heritage lets you select a general feat of your choice for which you meet the prereqs which means you could take versatile heritage and the ancestry feat that handed you a general feat for, you know, double the general feat action at level one. Literally, if your class is trained in fort but no other saves, that's iron will, lightning reflexes, expert in all three, out the gate. Now, of course, humans are receiving new ancestry feats. All of them happen much later in the game. First up at feat level nine, it's incredible improviser which gives you a plus three circumstance bonus to skill checks in which you're untrained, assuming you took clever improviser at some point in your career. You can attempt a skill check that would normally require you to be trained, even if you're untrained, but you don't get the plus three. Super relevant in a world where being untrained normally is a minus four, now it's a minus one. That's amazing. I'll take that if I'm a human, that's great. Whoopsie, we all have to roll occultism? I don't know anything about occultism. Incredible improviser, we'll figure it out. Anyway, multi-talented. Feed level nine, you get a second level multi-class dedication feat, even if you don't meet the ability score prereqs, and even if you normally couldn't take another dedication feat until you've taken more, holy crap, that's good. That lets you cheat into any class while you're still working on another one. So if you wanted to archetype into, say, Barbarian, and grab the once a day rage as a fighter who's running up like Paladin, boom, there it is. Or even better, if you're the barbarian who wants heavy armor for some reason that would be bad because you couldn't rage and stuff. Multi-talented would run you into the paladin dedication and grab you heavy armor and shields. Incredibly powerful. At level 13, unconventional expertise. Assuming you took unconventional weaponry and you're trained in the weapon you chose, you become an expert with it. Next up, we've got a couple new ancestry feats for the ancestry that saw the least amount, the half work. At feet level 9, reactive superstition, with of course, superstition as the prereq, is a reaction with the trigger. You attempt to save against a spell or magical effect, and you aren't benefiting from superstition. You instinctively react to magic by drawing on your superstitions. You gain the benefit of superstition against the triggering spell or magical effect. Didn't want to spend that action on your turn? Take this, golden. Of course, at feet level 13, weapon expertise orc makes you an expert in falchions, great axes, and all orc weapons. At this point in time, that's the orc knuckle dagger, fun, and the orc neck splitter, 
double fun. Honestly, I really wish we had a description for the next splitter because what is that? And of course, this is only going to get better as time goes on and more orc weapons are handed to us. For example, the orc hornbow of Pathfinder First Edition, my favorite reason to play an orc, a 2d6 composite longbow, or if they decide to get super crazy over there in Washington, the butchering axe, a weapon made by the orc smiths of Belk's and fingers crossed for that 3d6 great axe, or maybe like a 2d10 or something, I don't know what craziness they're gonna get up to. Anywho, scrolling back up to the top here, the dwarf is losing the unburdened ability the unburdened ability said if you were in heavy armor, your speed was reduced by five less. Same if you were encumbered. In addition, Ancient's Blood and Hardy are getting the axe and new heritages and ancestry feats are coming in to replace them. That's amazing because these were feats I complained about in a video I almost put out because you could only take them at first level because they were heritage feats. Ancient's Blood wasn't bad, but I would prefer to take it at like fifth or seventh after I had a little more resonance. Hardy, also pretty good against poison, but if I never see poison, trash feet. Now they're gone. Anywho, let's talk about these sweet heritages, shall we? First up, we've got Ancient Blooded. The Ancient Blooded heritage gives you the call on Ancient Blood reaction, but your resistance hampers your connection to magic items, which reduces your total resonance points by two to a minimum of zero. Call on Ancient Blood is a reaction when you attempt a saving throw against a magical effect. You get a plus two circumstance bonus to the triggering save or, you know, what Ancient's Blood did a second ago. Now we can take that, but also take like weapon familiarity so we can take our clan dagger and shove it in the ribcage of a giant. Anywho, Desert Dwarves, yeah, not just mountains here, get resistance to fire equal to half their level minimum one and the ability to ignore extreme and severe heat up to 140 degrees, aka the ability to hang out in Osirion and take no damage from being in the desert. That's situational, but good in the right conditions because severe heat will kill you dead. If there's no one in the party who's got endure elements, if you're far from water, oops, you died horribly. Desert dwarf, not gotta worry about it until it gets cold at night in the desert, but have a plan. Anyway, strong hearted dwarf. Gets poison resistance equal to half their level, and each of their successful saves against an ongoing poison reduces its stage by two or by one for a virulent. Criticals reduce it by three or by two, so hardy. Hardy is now, just like we saw a second ago, a heritage feat. We can take that and still be really good at running up to the goblin with our dwarven war axe and trimming his ears. And by that I mean splitting his head down the middle. Last up we've got the unburdened dwarf. Who? has the unburdened ability. If you want that now, you take it on the unburdened dwarf. I thought that was good. I thought that was definitely a reason to play a dwarf, but I don't know. I guess they were running away with the playtest and all of its loot and heavy armor as well. Now it's a, now it's a heritage. Anywho, we've got not one, not two, but three dwarf ancestry feats that are brand new to us. First up, Mountain's Stoutness. That allows you to withstand more punishment than most at feat level nine. It allows you to increase your max hit points by your level. Every time you gain a level, adjust your max hit points gain from Hardy. Hey, that's not a feat anymore. Wait a minute. I think they mean Mountain Stoutness accordingly. So at 9th you take this, you have 9. At 10th you have 10. You also gain a plus 1 circumstance bonus to recovery saves when you're dying. And if you have toughness, the hit points gained from each source are cumulative. Holy crap, I'm, this is a fever dream and suddenly I want to play dwarves and grow my beard out and punch orcs in the mouth with axes until they're bleeding on the floor. Surely that must actually mean that if I also have toughness at feet level 9, I gain 18 hit points. I'm gonna lean on that being the actual answer. Oh, by the way, your recovery save is increased to plus 4. And here, Stonewalker. Stonewalker allows you to gain Meld into Stone as a third level divine innate spell that you can cast once a day or once a day you have a panic button. If you have Stone Cunning, you can find unusual stonework and stonework traps as though you were legendary in perception. If you have Stone Cunning and are legendary, when you're not seeking and the GM rolls a secret check for you to notice unusual stuff, you keep the Stone Cunning bonus and don't take the minus two. So what that means is that circumstantial 
sometimes good ancestry feat that is only as good as the stone buildings you're around is now buffed a little bit. Oh, by the way, meld into stone is real good. Did you guys watch Doomsday Dawn? Did you watch my wizard cast meld into stone to dodge the manticore? Yeah, this is your panic button. Everyone needs it, and I promise I won't tell the rest of the clan if you have to hide from someone by fading into the mountain. Also, that's really good for like a dwarven ambush squad. They're all melded into stone. You turn the corner, crossbow bolts are flying. Anywho, weapon expertise for a dwarf lets you become an expert in battle axes, picks, and warhammers, and all dwarven weapons in which you are trained. Okay, so I refuse to believe those are actually good. Elves. Elves are fun. Let's talk about elves. Elves are losing the keen hearing ancestry feat and are getting a bunch of new elven heritages at first level. First up, the Arctic Elf. Gets resistance to cold equal to half its level and the ability to ignore extreme and severe cold down to minus 80 Fahrenheit. Oh, so for the record, the worst cold I've ever been in was minus 40 Fahrenheit on a wind chill one time. And that was a nightmare. This is 40 degrees colder. Holy crap. Going to the crown of the world, this is the race. Next up, the Cavern Elf Heritage. They're elves that come from underground tunnels or from caverns where light is scarce. Wait, drow? Is this drow? Are you a drow? I think that's a drow. Dark vision you get. The Keen-Eared Elf gets the ability to use the Seek action to sense unseen creatures in a 60-foot cone instead of 30 as long as they can hear normally. And when using the seek action to sense unseen creatures that you could hear within 30 feet, you get a plus two circumstance bonus. Yeah, no, still hung up on the drow. The drow are here. Anywho, jungle elf. Jungle elves when climbing trees, vines, and other foliage move at half their speed on a success and full speed on a critical success. And they move at full speed on a success if they grab quick climb. This does not affect you if you're using a climb speed, but that means you don't have to find a way to get a climb speed. Just, you know, get assurance or something, or roll really well and have quick climb and you're through the canopy. You also always may use the take cover action when within a forest or jungle to gain cover. Even if you're not next to an obstacle, you can take cover behind. So kind of a hide in plain sight-esque ability. Hanging out in the trees, wood elves. I love it. Of course, we have three new elf ancestry feats as well. Take Ancestral Longevity, gets a level nine. Expert Longevity says that when you choose a skill in which to become trained with Ancestral Longevity, you also choose a skill in which to become expert. You can choose only a skill in which you're already trained, so you buff a thing for free. When the effects of Ancestral Longevity and Expert Longevity expire, you can retrain one of your skill increases. The skill increase you gain from this retraining must either make you trained in the skill you chose with Ancestral Longevity or make you an expert in the skill you chose with Expert Longevity so you get to keep it. Try a thing, like it, realize it's a better choice for your party, but don't want to spend the downtime retraining? Boom, there it is. If your speed is 40 feet or more, so if you're an elf monk at level 9, elf step lets you step twice for one action or move 10 feet for one, or tiger style. So that means you can move 30 feet without provoking reactions. Of course, not a lot of things in the playtest right now have reactions, but still a thing. Though I imagine more likely you're elf stepping 10 feet and then taking off 80 feet if you really needed to run away. Anywho, weapon expertise elf makes you an expert in longbows, composite longbows, longswords, rapiers, shortbows, composite shortbows, and the elven curved blade, as well as all other elven weapons they introduced to the game. Of course, we've seen it with everyone else. Next up, it's the gnomes. In addition to losing discerning smell, we assume that's going to a heritage, the gnome's speed is being buffed from 20 feet to 25 feet. Wheeler Woe Podcast, you out there? You with me on this one? Tell Sabooks, it's important. Anywho. Of course, we have new heritages. First up, definitively, we see the Bleachling. Bleachlings are immune to the bleaching, so that means they don't have to find new things forever or die horribly, and they get Animal Speaker. They note that it's possible for your heritage to change from your starting heritage to this during the course of play due to the effects of the bleaching, though typically your campaign must span an incredibly long amount of time. Also, uh, by the way, the Spear of Neblin have come to us in the form of a heritage. 
Want dark vision? Want to be immune to the bleaching? Boom. Deep gnome ancestry, you got it there. Fell gnomes have a connection to gremlins and red caps, and that lets you cast Chill Touch as an innate primal spell. It will. The cantrip is heightened to a spell level equal to half your level rounded up, and that means you have the ability to damage stuff. The sharp nosed gnome gets that plus two circumstance bonus to sense an unseen creature that's close enough for you to smell, usually within 30 feet. Anywho, First World Adept at feet level 9 with the prerequisite First World Magic lets you get Fairy Fire and Invisibility, two spells that contradict each other but are also great, as in eight second level primal spells, each of which can be cast once a day. I love it. Gnome Rogue, need invisibility? There you go. First World Adept, you've got it. Vivacious Conduit says that if you rest for 10 minutes, you gain hit points equal to your con times your level. This healing is additive with any healing from treat wounds. Hashtag 5e short rest. Give or take like 10 minutes. I forget exactly how long that is. I am a pathfinder. Nevertheless, a party of gnomes just got real resilient in the dungeon. Tag out for 10 minutes, take a breath, apply a bandage. Safe. Of course, weapon expertise gnome lets you become an expert with the glaive, the kukri, and all those crazy gnome weapons. Next up, it's the goblins who are losing Eat Anything, Flame Heart, and Razor Teeth. These are being replaced, we assume, by the goblin heritages. First up, it's the Big Belly Goblin, who can subsist on food that most folk would consider spoiled. You are always considered fed with poor meals in a settlement as long as garbage is readily available without using the downtime activities. It's a plus two circumstance bonus to saving throws against toxins, against gaining the sick condition, and on removing it, but only if the toxin or condition resulted in you eating something you shouldn't have. Successes are, of course, treated as crit successes, and you can eat and drink things when you have the sick condition. Like, you know, the water you might need to get the taste of the, like, rotten pigeon you just ate out of your mouth? I don't judge. Inflammable Goblin gets resistance to fire equal to half its level. Its flat check to remove persistent fire damage is 15 instead of 20 without requiring an action to reduce the DC. The Razor Tooth should have probably brushed his teeth more, but the Jaws unarmed attack that deals a D6 of piercing? Yeah, sure. That's worth the tooth decay. Snow Goblins, the same as the Arctic Elf with its resistance to cold equal to half their level, and the ability to ignore extreme and severe cold, down to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Who's good on the elf? It's good here. I am disappointed that we don't see the monkey goblin. Oh well, perhaps 1.5, right? Pizer, plus, plus, can half. Anyway, Cave Climber at feet level 9 gives a goblin a climb speed of 10 feet. By practicing the techniques, it's learned crawling through the mines of Moria. You can also take the Legendary Climber feat, even if you don't have Quick Climb, provided you meet the other prereqs. Goblin Scuttle is a reaction we see on the goblins in the bestiary. When a goblin ally ends a move action adjacent to you, you can step. Didn't really find a use in Doomsday Dawn for this. I guess an all-goblin party might find a use for it. I don't know. Have you guys been watching the intro sessions for the Green Witch Colonies? Because we have a goblin paladin bard. Elu Swan Song, Paladin of Shaylin, likes to sing and is definitely taking Goblin Song as one of its new ancestry feats because that's a performance check against the will DC of a foe within 30 feet for one action. If you're an expert, you can affect up to two. If you're a master, you can affect up to four. Legends can affect up to eight. On a success, it's a minus one conditional penalty to perception checks, which is great. We have two rogues in the party and will saves, which is great for I, the druid, for a round, a critical success. The penalty lasts for a minute. Only on a critical failure are they bolstered. So a goblin bard or a goblin anything with performance can just la 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 la, everyone's mad, but also has a worse will save. Good enough for me. Now, if you took goblin scuttle at level nine, skittering scuttle, Let's you stride up to half your speed instead of stepping. That's a little better. If nothing else, it's kind of cool for the horde of goblins you might fight. Because as a reaction, if you're moving, say your speed's 30, say you took fleet or are a goblin monk or something, and everybody can as a reaction just move 15 feet forward. Yeah, it's a little Minds of Moria flavor. Better make sure they cannot pass, but they might, because they're faster and might be able to climb. Anywho, Weapon expertise for the goblin, of course, makes them an expert in the dog slicer, the horse chopper, and all goblin weapons in which they're trained at feet again, level 13. Next up, it's the halfling. 
in my opinion, one of the strongest ancestries in this playtest. The halfling is losing plucky and keen eyes. Keen eyes is just turning into an ancestry feature. Every halfling has it. Every halfling, when they attack a target or opponent that's concealed, they reduce the flat check to three for concealed or nine for sensed, and it's a plus two circumstance bonus while using the seek action to sense unseen stuff. And of course, they've got new heritages as well. If the gutsy halfling succeeds at a saving throw against an emotion effect, it's a critical success. The jungle halfling can ignore a difficult terrain from trees and foliage. A nomadic halfling gets a new language of their choice at level one, and every time they take the multilingual feat, they gain another new language. So it's the Tengu. Who could invest in the linguistics for double the profit? Nah, now it's the halfling. The twilight gets low light vision. Seems good. Anyway, we've got three new ancestry feats. The first has a prereq that's lucky halfling at feat level nine. It's guiding luck, which says you can trigger lucky halfling when you fail a perception check or an attack roll. In addition to its normal trigger, when did the witch get here? That's so amazing. Now it's not just fail a save, or I gotta fix it. Now everyone's a halfling, or everyone's adopted by halflings and taking two feats, or they're not optimized. As a reaction, you fumble an attack and you're gonna throw your sword off the chasm. Of course, that's not raw, but we have fun. As a reaction, you fail a perception check and you're about to get surprised. Fix it. Roll with advantage. This is true strike on a reaction. Irrepressible says that if you succeeded a saving throw against an emotion effect, treat it as a critical success, which is what the gutsy halfling does. Oh yeah, if your heritage was the gutsy halfling, critical failures are treated as failures. Approved invasion versus being sad. Can't keep him down. Weapon expertise with the halfling at feet level 13 lets you become an expert in slings, halfling sling staves, short swords, and all halfling weapons like the filter's fork. So this has been a crazy night. 1.4 is out, it's among us, and I'm excited to get to brewing. Min-maxing for fun and profit is going to look a lot different now. My playtest character that I'm playing pretty much as soon as I get home from work is going to look a lot different now. I am stoked. What do you guys think about all this madness? Can we officially call the cavern elf a drow? How many people do you think we need to send to Washington to riot before we get our monkey goblin on a heritage? And most importantly, are we still stoked out there for the Pathfinder playtest? Let me know in the comments. As always, we'll keep that conversation rolling. Thank you guys so much for watching and be sure to like and subscribe for more content. The next episode of your Pathfinder playtest coverage, mid-maxing for fun and profit, where we build ourselves an alchemist who's archetyped into wizard, drops this Saturday.